All right. Did you have a good week? Yeah? Good. Excellent. Uh, this was quite a Colorado week, wasn't it? It was freezing and sunny. and My wife, um, who's sitting in the back there, Violetta, she, we moved to Colorado about a year ago. She doesn't love the fact that snow will come and then it will go. When, when she wants to live in a place where when it snows, it just stays there for months and months. I lived like that. She's never lived like that. She doesn't know what it's like. Um, I lived in eastern South Dakota and western South Dakota and Wyoming, and when it snows, then it just stays there forever. So I have to say, I really like this Colorado thing where you get the snow, and then you get the sun, then you get the snow, then you get the sun. Anybody else with me on that? See, I told you you were wrong, babe. I told you. I told you you were wrong. All right, so uh, Jamie has asked me to talk about biblical sexuality, which I think is going to be great. I don't know if anybody noticed in the bulletin the closing hymn, um, which apparently was selected before the topic was known, is He Touched Me. Um, This is not by design. I actually posted this on my Facebook page yesterday and my Twitter account because I thought it was funny, and I said, are there any other hymns that could have been similarly funny? And I got a lot of great suggestions. Uh, Nothing between, um, softly and tenderly, I surrender all. There's a lot of great ones out there. So we're going to start with prayer. We're going to be having, insofar as it's possible, have a seat, young man. Insofar as it's possible, we're going to keep this presentation PG. Um, But this afternoon's conversation, Q&A, I think will be uh, PG-13. And there's a children's program. So uh, you're not on that topic, I'm informed. So uh, anyway. So this will be as PG as possible, and we're going to pray and get right into this, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Are you ready? Father in heaven, uh, bless us now as we open our hearts to you and as we open the text of Scripture. Father, when we're learning about biblical sexuality, what we're really learning about is ourselves. Uh, Lord, you made us in a specific way, in a purposeful way, in an intentional way, and we're happy to report in a beautiful way. Father, we are thankful for the way that we are made. We say with the psalmist that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And Father, we know that we are only echoing your own enthusiasm about human beings because you looked out at the close of the creation week and you said that everything that you had made, including us, was very good. And so, Father, the prayer of my heart today is that the presentation would be characterized by clarity. And Father, living in the times in which we do here, Uh, 2022, there is a need for tremendous biblical clarity and personal clarity on the topic of human sexuality. But Father, I also pray that the presentation will be characterized by charity and that we would not feel a smugness or an arrogance about what we know and certainly not a condemnation of others, but that we would just have a heart like that yeast just a moment ago that was overflowing, that our hearts would be overflowing with gratitude for the privilege of knowing what we know, knowing who we are, and knowing who you are. And so, Father, my prayer is that today will be a great presentation. People will learn, they will understand, and we also pray for this afternoon's time together. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, let all of God's people say amen amen and amen. All right, I brought my own clicker because the last time I was here, I really didn't like the clicker at all, and so I'm advising that you get a new clicker. Um... So our presentation today, this is actually a variation of a presentation that I did about three years ago in a sermon series in my local church in Australia. The sermon series was titled Eden Every Day, and so this will be a variation of that presentation. Part of what what we talked about was biblical sexuality, and we're going to look at several things today. Today I've titled the presentation, And They Shall Be One Flesh. This is a reference, of course, to Genesis chapter 2, A Biblical View of Sexuality. Um, Just a few words by way of introduction, and then I originally had, and I'm just going to run this by Jamie right now on the spot, I originally had three things I was going to talk about, but I think it'll be a little too much material, so I'm going to sort of bait you in to coming this afternoon, and what I'll try and do is spend the first maybe 10 minutes of that going over the third uh, element that I was going to go over today. It'll slow our presentation down here a little bit, and uh, I don't have to speak at 150%, only 125%. Normal speed. So here we go. The Bible opens with a marriage in Eden and closes with a marriage in Eden restored. So it would be a really cool and beautiful way to think about the Bible as sort of bookended between two marriages, right? One is the marriage of God, uh, where he performs the marriage of Adam and Eve, the man and the woman in the garden. And then, of course, the final marriage in Genesis, or excuse me, Revelation 21 and 22 is the marriage of God himself to his bride. 
And it's a really beautiful and, dare I even say, romantic way to think about the Bible as pinched between two perfect marriages. And uh, I stand before you today as a very happily married man. We're approaching, we're not quite at 25 years yet, but we're getting there. And uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about marriage and, of course, the outgrowth of of marriage, which is sexuality. Um, Marriage, as we leave the sort of uh, Edenic ideal of Genesis 1 1 and 2... It's very obvious that marriage was created with man's happiness and holiness. And when I say man here, I mean mankind. And we'll get into that in just a second. Maybe I should be more precise and say humankind's happiness and holiness are clearly in view with both the Sabbath and with marriage. And one quick thing that I'll say about this is we sometimes incorrectly and unbiblically hold in tension holiness and happiness. But in fact... We will, if we really take a, a deeper look at what holiness is and what God intends for our happiness, we will find that these are actually not two things. They're one thing. Your happiness and your holiness are inexorably connected together. They're almost synonymous. And God gave us not only the Sabbath for both happiness and holiness, He gave us marriage. And then, of course, as a part of marriage, sexual union, which we'll talk about in a bit. In his excellent book, The Meaning of Marriage, anybody here read this book by Timothy Keller? Okay, this book is a 10 out of 10, and I only rarely recommend books virtually without reservation, and this is a book that you can read. uh, If you're already married, uh, strongly advise that you read this book. It is outstanding. Get two copies, one for the husband, one for the wife. Read it together. If you are unmarried, I can tell you this. When I am asked to marry people, which does occasionally happen, I, I, I I say I will do that, on the condition that we're going to read this book together, the three of us. And so this is the book that I actually use as my sort of pre-marriage counseling. It's excellent. So it's titled The Meaning of Marriage. And in that book, Keller says, evidence continues to mount that marriage, indeed traditional, exclusively monogamous marriage, brings enormous, what's that next word? Enormous benefits of all kinds. To adults, yes, and even more to children and society at large. He continues, there has never been a culture or a century that we know of in which marriage was not central to human life. This is not something that is uniquely or idiosyncratically Judeo-Christian. Every culture that we know of, every prosperous culture, has the idea of a union between a man and a woman. Now, some of those cultures have variations on that theme, and we'll talk briefly about polygamy. But the idea that the foundation of society is the union between a man and a woman is something that Keller says is universal. It's unanimous among all cultures. And uh, so we're going to talk today, I originally was going to talk about three things. The biblical portrait of marriage, finding the right one, and then happily ever after. But what I'd like to do, Jamie, with your permission, is just leave off the happily ever after. It'll give us a little more time here this morning to go deep on a couple things, or deeper. And uh, then if you're interested in that sort of, uh, if you're interested in living happily ever after, <laughs> right? I'm sure none of you are interested in that, um, then we can sort of do that at the beginning of our afternoon presentation, and it won't take too long. There are a great many passages that sort of inform a biblical understanding of marriage and of sexuality, and this is, of course, just a very partial list, but these would be inarguably some of the most important passages. Genesis 1, 2, and I should have put 3 up there as well, are really paradigmatic. And what we mean by paradigmatic is they're the passages that shape everything that comes after that. Through the rest of the Old Testament and all of the New Testament, everything is seen through the lens of Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Perfectly paradigmatic, and we will spend some time there momentarily. Um, Proverbs chapter 31 is the well-known Proverbs 31 wife chapter. Very beautiful, poetic, romantic. Uh, Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 to 10, is a section in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus challenges many of the prevailing ideas about marriage and about divorce uh, and about the roles of men and women in his culture and in his situation. Incidentally, if I could just make a little plug here, uh, right now in, uh, on the Storyline YouTube channel, Storyline Church YouTube channel, and also the Storyline app, um, my friend Ty Gibson and I are in the midst of a 10-part series, a 10-part walk through the Sermon on the Mount titled Kingdom Manifesto. Uh, This week is part three, and what we're actually talking about this week and next week are some of those really tricky, some would say problematic passages in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus talks about marriage and divorce. And so if you're interested in better understanding the Sermon on the Mount, I would advise you to just go have a look at that series. We're really happy with the way it turned out. Then we have Ephesians chapter 5, which is some of, you know, Paul, Paul is, of course, a great writer, a great thinker, very poetic, actually. I think he's undervalued as a poetic writer. 
And in Ephesians chapter 5, we have some of those great passages there where Paul talks about husbands love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. We'll return to that momentarily. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and 13, Paul writing to a very sick church, a troubled church, a dysfunctional church, and addresses some problematic issues, especially in chapter 7. And then, of course, 13 is you know, colloquially known as the love chapter. And so, anyway, those are some key biblical passages that we'll be drawing from here. But we're going to spend some, some significant time right now in Genesis 1 to 3. And I'm not going to read all of the relevant passages. In order to do that, we'd have to read the whole of Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. I'm going to assume here, and perhaps this is an unsafe assumption, that many of you are familiar with the basic narrative. And we will read a couple um, salient verses in Genesis chapter 2. But Richard Davidson in his book, The Flame of Yahweh, or just Flame of Yahweh. Now, this is a book that's big. Um, as my friend Jennifer likes to say, you know, it's a book and it also doubles as a weapon. If anybody broke into your house, you could probably do some damage with this book. But I would strongly encourage you to own this book, okay? Um, I have no financial investment in this at all, of course. Uh, it was written by a fellow named Richard Davidson. He's the dean of the Theological Seminary at Andrews University. And that book might be big and it might feel, you know, look a little intimidating. It's titled Flame of Yahweh, Sexuality in the Old Testament. And basically, this is the life work of Dr. Davidson, who knows Hebrew better than I know English. And what he does is he goes through every single passage in the Old Testament that deals either directly or secondarily or even tangentially with sex. And he looks at every single passage. And so you can think of it as kind of a resource that you would definitely want to have on your shelf, um, particularly if you have young children or if you just are interested yourself in what the Bible has to say. I mean, that alerts you to the fact that the Bible has quite a little bit to say about sexuality. Are you with me? That's only the Old Testament. Okay, so strongly advise that you get this book. I use this book just this week as I'm going through uh, the Old Testament. We're doing a, a program right now called OT with DA. And in Genesis 34, we came upon the story, the unfortunate, terrible, tragic story of the rape of Jacob's daughter Dinah. And uh, I wanted to better understand that story and understand some of the grammar and the Hebrew and the, the prepositions. And so I went and read several pages in uh, the book Flame of Yahweh. And so it's a great resource, strongly recommend it, and I'll be drawing on it uh, in several um, slides today. You'll see, in fact, right now. So Davidson says, the paradigmatic nature of Genesis 1 to 3 for sexuality has been widely recognized, particularly in the context of marriage. All he's saying here is that everything that follows from Genesis chapter 4 to Revelation chapter 22 that we know about marriage and about this, the sexual norm and the sexual ideal that God has for human beings goes through the lens or the paradigm of Genesis 1, 2, and 3. In fact, in another place, Davidson actually says, and I'm with him on this, that the whole Bible is really contained embryonically in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, and everything that follows is really, in some sense, commentary on the major themes that are found in the first three chapters of Genesis. Incredible to think that almost everything in the whole of Scripture is found embryonically in just the first three chapters. They're timeless, they're beautiful, they're poetic, and they are fantastic. Okay, so that's the point that Davidson is making here, and the reason that's helpful to us is that as soon as we get out of Genesis 1 and 2 into Genesis chapter 3 and beyond, we find dramatic departures from God's sexual ideal and intent. I mean, it, as I just mentioned a moment ago, in Genesis 34, the rape of Dinah, clearly this is a departure, as we all know intuitively and understand, from God's sexual ideal. And so, if we're going to understand what's right, what's wrong, what's permissible, what's ideal, Davidson is saying we're going to have to look through some lens, some grounding, some mooring, something that anchors us, particularly in the world in which we find ourselves today, 2022, where everything is up for grabs. Everything is on the table. And let's be honest, a world that you and I could have never imagined, a world that you and I 20 or 30 years ago would have laughed, we would have, we would have scoffed at some of the ideas that are now becoming not just fringe, uh, but are actually mainstream. And we are finding ourselves being pulled and pushed by the prevailing winds of a society unmoored from any sexual anchor or sexual transcendence. And so this is the point that Davidson is making. If we're going to understand not only the rest of Scripture, but frankly the rest of human history, we have to be moored, we have to be anchored to something. And so this is the point he's making. Now let's continue to sort of unpack this. In the opening chapters of Flame of Yahweh, Davidson does something that's very helpful, and I want to spend time on each of these. He walks through basically 10 identifying characteristics of sexuality and human interconnectedness from a biblical perspective. This is the paradigm. This is the lens, Davidson says, through which we should view healthy, 
human sexuality, the way that God intended it, the way that when God looked out over the vast uh, you know, array, the vast diversity of his creation, he said, it was very good. And I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on each of these, and if you're interested in going deeper and still deeper, I would advise you to order the book and, and read it. By the way, it is a scholarly book to be sure, um, but it's actually quite readable. Very readable. He's an excellent writer and a fantastic thinker. And so let's just go through each of these sort of in order. And I've made a few notes here that I want to highlight about each one. Okay, so the first point that Davidson brings out is that sexuality is a part of creation order. It's a part of the thing that God said was very good. A really simple and colloquial way to say this would be to say God invented sex. God created sex. And what this does is actually really cool because it kind of demystifies sex. Uh, human sexuality has always been a source of significance and meaning for all cultures in all times and all situations. But what Genesis 1, 2, and 3 does is it helps us to see sexuality as something that's good, something that's beautiful, and something that God intentioned. And so Davidson makes the very salient and correct observation that human sexuality, the sort of sexual dimorphism between male and female, is actually a part of God's good intent. And uh, I give a resounding, enthusiastic amen to that. The second thing is that we are exposed to a heterosexual duality as the ideal marital form. And uh, this is clear from the text. Now, some people will read uh, the Genesis chapters 1 and 2, and they'll see the word Adam, and they will assume that the word Adam here means male. Actually, nowhere in the entire Hebrew Bible does the word Adam mean male. Ha-Adam simply means the human. And so you can actually do yourself kind of a little... Uh, insightful favor, go back and read Genesis 1 and 2, and every time you come across the word Adam, ha-Adam, just say the human, the human. And if, if you get this kind of in your mind, already we're beginning to lay a groundwork that we're going to talk about more in the fourth point. We're getting there in just a second. So not only heterosexual, that Adam and Eve are sexually and socially complementary, but number three, they are monogamous. There were not two Eves for one Adam. There were not th uh, two Adams for one Eve, what's called polyandry. There's not polygamy or polyandry in the Garden of Eden. There is one man and one woman. And the two come together in a one fleshness that we'll talk about. In fact, we might as well just talk about it right now. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2, if you'd join me there, right at the very beginning of your Bible. Genesis is the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. And then we're in Genesis chapter 2. And we'll begin reading, the story really begins in verse 18, right, in terms of the, the union and the creation of Eve. And so we're going to go Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, and we'll read down to the end of the chapter. And Yahweh said, I'm going to purposefully use the word Yahweh here to separate him from the other variations and versions of the regional deities that existed in the time of Moses, the author of Genesis. So verse 18, and Yahweh said, it is not good that man should be alone, that humankind should be alone, not just that males should be alone. It's not good that human beings should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Now, we're going to come back to that word helper in just a little bit, because there's a lot of misunderstandings about what the word means and what it doesn't mean, and I'm going to try to clarify that today. Verse 19, out of the ground, Yahweh formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. I love the delegation here. This is one of the features of God's governance is that he delegates everything that can be delegated and reserves only for himself that which he alone can do. It's a beautiful feature of God's government and of his character. So he says, hey, Adam, what do you think of these things? Oh, that's giraffe and that's hippopotamus. And he's naming these various kinds of animals. Verse 20, so Adam gave names to all the cattle, to all the birds of the air. I would have enjoyed that part particularly. I'm a birder. And to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. God has done this purposefully to create within Adam a longing that he otherwise might have known or been able to put his finger on the pulse of it. As the animals apparently paraded before him, they went by in pairs. They went by in twos, in couples. And so Adam sees the two giraffes and the two hippopotamus, and he sees. And all of a sudden, he's looking around for one like him, right? He sees the animals playing and sporting and frolicking together and, and gravitating toward their own kind. And he's now wondering, well, where is my kind? Where is my companion? Where is my helper? And so God has done this purposefully and beautifully, poetically, to create within Adam a longing that he might up to that point have not fully understood. Um, so then verse 21, and Yahweh caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, on the human being. 
And he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. We'll talk more about this in a second. And the rib which Yahweh had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And then Adam said, then the human being said, ah, this is now bone of my bones. And there's this revelatory, enthusiastic, you know, surprise here. He's so happy as he wakes up from his deep sleep. Oh, this is what I was looking for. Not a hippopotamus, not a giraffe, not a cheetah. This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Then the last two verses, very important verses. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. One flesh, not one spirit, which would be easy to understand. They become one spirit, they think alike, you know, they agree with one another, they have the same goals and aspirations. No, it's even stronger than that. They become one flesh, which is a poetic and uh, I would say modest, but also unambiguous reference to the sexual union between a man and a woman. And then finally, verse 25, very beautiful, very romantic, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed of their nakedness. And so human sexuality, human nakedness, the beautiful human form is not something to be ashamed of. And there in the Garden of Eden, it was great. It was wonderful. Adam has his partner. All the animals have their partners. And it looks like things are going to just go from, you know, good to great and better still. Okay? So a monogamous marital form. Now we're on number four. One of the things that I believe is clearly taught in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is that there is an equality of sexes without any hint of hierarchy. This is a little controversial, but I'm going to try to wade into what I think is just a very reasonable biblical portrait here. So basically no one in the world, no Christian person denies that there is an ontological equality between man and woman in Genesis 1 and 2. Everybody agrees with that, right? Even the most diehard male headship proponent will say Yes, there is an ontological unity. What do you mean by ontological? In terms of the nature of being. That man was not worth more. Males were not worth more than females. And females were not worth less. A good way to think about this perhaps is to have a dollar in one hand and four quarters in another. The, the equi- they are the equivalent, but they're different. And uh, so they'll say, no, there's no, there's no differentiation on, in terms of an essential equality, right? We think of some of the founding documents of the United States of America. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That, that what does it say? That all, all and, and what's intended there is not all males are created equal, but all people, right? All, humankind is equal, and that's what we would refer to as an ontological equality. But some will suggest, even though there was an ontological equality, there was actually a hierarchical differentiation. That even before sin, men, males, operated in some hierarchical or superior position hierarchically to their spouses. And I just want to spend a little bit of time sort of walking through why I think that is not the case. First of all, one of the most interesting things is that in the descriptions of the creation of man and the creation of woman, male and female, the identical number of Hebrew words is used, 16, right? So in 2.7, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and in 2.21 and 22, when man is described and when the creation of woman is, is described, there is no question in the minds of Davidson and other Hebrew scholars that this is purposeful. It's not serendipitous. It's not, oh, look at that, the same number of words. In fact, this is actually in radical contrast with most ancient Near Eastern depictions of creation where the female is not mentioned at all. So not only here is the creation of the female given prominence, and I'm going to point to just a second, even in some sense preeminence, which I'll come to, but they are both given the same number of Hebrew words, 16 Hebrew words to describe the creation of male and then also a female of Adam and of Eve. Number two, some people will point, I think mistakenly, to the idea, well, well, man was made first, as if there's some kind of a preeminence in being made first. Well, by that logic, then the animals would be above man, because they were made first. But let's take it a step further. The actual narrative of Genesis 1 and 2 is not moving from inf- uh, you know, superior to inferior or anything like that. It's actually moving from chaos to completion. From incompletion to completion, think about the Genesis uh, 1, sort of verses 1 to 3 account. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. This is a chaotic picture. 
And God then starts to bring order out of chaos. He creates spaces, spaces in the air, spaces on the land, uh, spaces in the water. He then begins to fill those spaces in this beautiful, you know, crescendoing picture of creation. And the, the creation account moves not from some hierarchical inferiority to superiority or superiority to inferiority, no. The account is moving from chaos and incompletion, even confusion, frankly, to increasing order. And when we find ourselves at the very climax, the height of the created order, let's ask ourselves this question, what's the last thing that God makes in the first six days of creation? It's a woman. It's a female. And so the case is actually, it's easier to make the case that the climax of God's created work is humankind of which the female is singled out particularly. Now this is actually even more singled out in the Hebrew verbs that are used to describe the creation of Adam and Eve. Uh, the verb, very interesting actually, the verb that is used to describe the creation of man or, or Adam is yasar. And it is the generic word for to make, to fabricate, to, to create something. But the Hebrew word for the creation of woman is bana. And it literally is the word to build. It has the idea of architecture built into it. So Adam, as it were, was just sort of thrown together almost haphazardly, but the woman being more aesthetically beautiful, and I think this is objectively true, um, she is built. She is, she is architected. And Davidson makes a really great point. The use of the word build is not only a reference to aesthetics, it's a reference to permanence and reliability. Very interesting. Something that is built, something that is fabricated in the way that a city is built or the way that a building is built is built for the purposes of permanence and reliability. I mean, look at the building that we're in here. Great thought and intentionality went into this building so that it would be here in heat and in cold, in storm and in fair weather. And so the, the use of those two different words actually suggests that as God is moving from incompletion to completion, it's getting more and more and more and more amazing and beautiful and complete. And so the fact that the woman is created last and she, just to throw in another little element here, is so much like Yahweh in this sense. She is the life giver. She is the life bringer. A woman is, within her very biology, a homemaker. She is stable. She is permanent. She carries a human being in her body. She feeds a human being from her body. She supports a child, not just in the in utero stage, but even in the formative, you know, first, second, and third years when there is complete reliance upon the body of the woman. Well, you can begin to see how beautiful this is that God is moving from chaos to completion, and it concludes with this grand, well-built, beautiful human form that is basically capacitated to support life in a way that's unique and wonderful. Amen? Okay, I thought the men might say amen on that one. Here's another very interesting one. The word that is used, helper, I will make a helper for him, is the Hebrew phrase, ezer konegdo. Ezer konegdo. And there's a little bit of a disappointment here in the English translation because the word helper almost has the, well, it does in English have the association of a subordinate. You know, if, some, if I'm the boss and, and she's my helper or he's my helper, clearly I'm the superordinate and they're my subordinate. Right? But the, the, the Hebrew verb here, ever, uh, Ezra Konegdo, does not have any sense at all of subordination or of lesser. In fact, the word is used 21 times in the Hebrew Old Testament. 16 of those times, it is unambiguously the case that the Ezra Konegdo is the superordinate. In fact, God refers to himself repeatedly as the Ezra Konegdo, the helpmeet of Israel. So who is subordinate to who in that relationship? Is Israel subordinate to God or is God subordinate to Israel? So disabuse your mind of that little whisper in the, in the English word helper that suggests that the man is the real business end of things and the woman's just here to help him get on with life. Not at all. In 16 of the 21 uses of this phrase in the Hebrew Old Testament, the Ezra Konegdo occupies a superordinate position, the higher position in an assumed hierarchy. Okay, very interesting. I'm not suggesting here that the woman is over, but only that there is an equality here, not only an ontological equality, an essential equality, but a hierarchical equality. Um, one final word on this. Notice that man is, in, 
it, Adam, the male, is completely asleep in the creation of woman. He exercises no active role in the making of the woman. None at all. In other words, God puts him asleep so that he can then do the thing that he does, right? Man exercises no uh, part, no active part of the creation of woman. And for these and many other reasons that I could spend time on, it's very obvious to me that in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, what is presented here is a picture where both Adam and Eve answer to the Creator directly, both share a procreational responsibility to be fruitful and multiply, both are called to subdue the earth, and both are called to exercise dominion. So far, so good, everyone? Okay, I hope you like that. And if you didn't, you can come talk to me. Um, okay, then number five, sexuality and wholeness. One of the really great things, and Davidson brings this point out, is that, that as contrasted with other ancient Near Eastern creation myths, Adam and Eve are not slaves, menial slaves to do the work of the gods. No, they are depicted as co-regents with the Creator. I want to say that word again, co-regents. We actually get this very image in the book of Revelation where the Bible says that God has made us kings and priests to God. Is it only going to be the men that are kings and priests? No, it's the men and the women. Jesus said, he that overcomes will sit with me on my throne. There is no male-female distinction between who will occupy the, the throne of God in the universe. It will be all of the redeemed because men and women both equally and yet uniquely bear the image of God. Can somebody say amen? Okay, great. So sexuality and wholeness and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. Sexuality and exclusivity. This is the outgrowth of monogamy. There is no second Adam here. There is no second Eve here. In fact, as Genesis unfolds, we see the, the terrible uh, consequences of uh, polygamy. And we're, we're supposed to be reading Genesis and going, wow, that's a really bad situation. I've just finished studying through and reading through the story of Jacob. And Jacob worked for seven long years for Leah's, and it, or Rachel rather, and it's so beautiful. It says that they were as like a day to him. But then, of course, Laban pulls this little fast trick, and he ends up marrying, I mean, talk about a, a nightmare of a nightmare situation. Not just two wives, but sister wives. Someone has told me, and I don't know this because I don't read Chinese characters, but I'm told that the Chinese character for war is a roof with two women under it. <laughs> I've been saying that for years and no one has ever contradicted it, so I think it's accurate. There's a roof, there's the symbol of a roof, and then he put two women and that's the symbol for war. So imagine if you have not just two women in one home, but two women that are sisters in one home. You think, oh, that sounds messy. It's like reality television and it's exactly what is de described in Genesis. So as soon as we break from sexuality and exclusivity, God's sexual ideal begins to collapse and the human situation and human happiness begins to collapse. Number seven, sexuality and permanence. This is communicated in the verse that we just read a moment ago. Therefore, the man shall leave his, his family and be joined, the old King James, cleave, right? That, that there will be an attachment, an attachment that is so permanent, so, so purposefully, structurally permanent that they're actually described as one flesh, Again, not just one spirit, which would be much easier to understand, but one flesh, that there is a, a bodily connection between the man and the woman that symbolizes the social, spiritual connection that they are to share, okay? And we'll talk, I think, about, about that this afternoon, keeping it PG here. Um, sexuality and intimacy, there's a, a real beautiful thing here where it is the man that leaves, which is actually kind of interesting. If the woman was just the sort of, you know, ontological inferior, the subordinate to man, you would expect the woman to be doing the moving. The woman goes to where the man is because the man's not going anywhere. The man's going to stay right here and you come to me. It's actually the opposite. And Davidson says this is unique in the ancient Near Eastern uh, depictions of the creation account where the man actually leaves his stability and his former situation and goes to win, dare I say, to woo the female. Absolutely beautiful. Um, sexuality and procreation, uh, that the, the purpose of human sexuality is not merely for pleasure, for enjoyment, and for intimacy and connection, but it is for creation. And I just want to marvel about this for a second. I've said this many times before. When God surveyed the possible options for creating beings made in His image, He was not constrained by what we now see in front of us. He could have done it in other ways, presumably. It was not necessary that human sexuality work in the way that it does. Um, for example, it could have been a lot less interesting, a lot less enjoyable. 
Uh, the procreative act could have been something analogous to a handshake. Hey, sweetheart, I think we should maybe consider having children. Okay, we have the conversation. We decide to bring a child into the world. Okay, you ready? I'm ready. Here we go. There it is. We're going to have a child. I mean, yeah, it would serve, you know, it would have a certain utility to it, but it would lack a lot of fun, enjoyment, pleasure, mystery. And so it's a remarkable thing. Think about this, and I know you know this, most of you, those of you that are over the age of, say, 13, you know this, but I want you to hear it maybe with new ears. The most pleasurable, most vulnerable, most intimate thing that two human beings can do together is the thing that creates life. Think of the genius of this. What is God trying to communicate? That creating life is deeply pleasurable. That creating life is something that is mysterious and wonderful and awesome and filled with pleasure. The, the word Eden, Garden of Eden, literally means pleasure. So just let that settle into your brains. It's not just a handshake. It's not a fist bump or a side hug. It's this incredible act of two bodies coming together in, in social sexual union, and that is the life-giving act? So cool and so unnecessary. In terms of just straight utility, no, God's spiced it up a little bit. He sweetened it up a little bit because, again, it was the Garden of Eden. Um, I think that's enough. Let's kind of press on here. Uh, a few quotations from Davidson, and then we'll press on. So Davidson says, the holistic view of sexuality means that the one flesh experience of husband and wife involves not only the sex act, but also a oneness or a wholeness, a wholeness, a connection. Remember, this is what Adam exclaims. This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. In some sense, Adam felt incomplete. He now, when he sees Eve, feels complete. He feels like now I'm, I'm whole now. And Ellen White has a great term for this in the book Patriarchs and Prophets. She says that our, our godly spouse, whether our wife or our husband, she says becomes like our second self. Our second self. Now, with somebody who's been married approaching 25 years, I can tell you this is, if you're happily married, you know exactly what this looks like. I'll give you an illustration that I've used many times over the years. If I have done something, and, and for the vast, you know, most of our lives, Violet and I, we do things together, but occasionally we're apart, and uh, I might go eat at an amazing restaurant, or taste an amazing dish, or see a great movie, or read a wonderful book, or visit an incredible national park, and Violet is not with me. This does occasionally happen. And almost reflexively, it takes no energy for me to do this. When I've had that experience, I just instantly, reflexively, always think, I've got to show this to Violetta. Violetta has got to taste this. Violetta has got to read this. Violetta has got to see this. Vi because in some sense, and I know that many of you that are happily married here will know exactly what I'm talking about. In some sense, if I have experienced something that has brought me happiness and joy, and my wife has not, it feels like I haven't fully experienced it. And then when we go to do it together, I'm now beginning to have that sort of Edenic experience where I think, okay, now this experience is complete. Uh, one of Violet and I don't argue about many things. We argue about driving. Um, and one of the great, the great, uh, and I'm, I'm just, without her permission, I'm just going to tell you this story. One of the great uh, struggles in our marriage has been that I have, we're bird watchers, and we have a rule, and it's a, it's an, it's a well-defined rule that I'm reminded of on a regular basis, that we are not allowed to see new species of bird without the other person. And uh, I was the first to violate this rule several years ago when there was what was called an owl invasion. An owl invasion is something that happens in the winter months when, for whatever reason, there's a decrease in the rodent or lemming populations in the far north of Canada, and owls are forced to move further and further south to find food. And you get these incredible invasions in the north of Minnesota and Michigan and in other places where you just see owls. We went out one time during an owl invasion, and we saw 101 great gray owls in a single day. A great gray owl is something, you know, it's the largest owl in North America. You'd be happy to see one in your life. We saw 101 in a single day. Well, there was reports that not, and by the way, we saw a lot of what are called northern hawk owls, which are also a wonderful boreal species. And we had heard reports that there was a boreal owl that was being seen in the north of Michigan, in the north of Minnesota. And I said, hey, Violet, I want to go. I want to take some pictures of the northern hawk owls, which we'd seen together. So that was okay. That was sus. And I wanted to see some... Uh, uh, great gray owls, which she'd seen, so that was sus. And she gave me explicit instructions when I left. Under no circumstances are you to see any birds 
that we have not seen together. Well, as providence would have it, as God in His great mercy would have it, to, to give me a rewarding experience and to teach Violetta the lessons of patience and forgiveness, <laughs> I ended up finding one of the, the, arguably the most difficult North American owl to find, and it's called a boreal owl. It's about the size of a soda pop can, stunningly beautiful. Not only did I see it, it sat preening itself and sunning itself and even feeding on a roadside for about six hours. And I just said, I called Violetta. I said, you're not going to believe what I'm looking at right now. And I think she hung up on me anyway. We, we've, <laughs> we're working through it. We're seeing a therapist. Pray for us. This happened like 15 years ago. Um, but the point is, in some weird way, having that amazing experience, and she has reminded me of it hundreds of times in the course of our marriage. What was that that uh, uh, I read one theologian said years ago? Love does not make careful historians. I have not found that to be the case in my marriage. Um, but in some sense, when, when you experience something that's particularly wonderful or delightful or beautiful, if you've not experienced it with your spouse, you feel like you've not fully experienced it. Right? And this is the point that he's making here. A oneness, a wholeness in all of the physical, sensual, social, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual dimensions of life. Of which sex is a part. But sex is only a part. And that's the world that we live in today. Where the magnification of a part, the part is made into the whole and the whole is completely dismissed. Okay, we'll talk more about that this afternoon because I'm trying to keep this PG. Davidson continues, Adam in effect exclaims at the first sight of Eve, at last I'm whole. Here is the complement of myself. Here is my companion. He recognizes, and the narrative instructs us, that the man in, is whole only in his complementarity with another being who is like himself. And this, again, is the brilliance of God allowing the animals to parade before Adam so that he could have an arousal to a need that he would not have otherwise fully comprehended until he saw that everybody else was in pairs and he was singular. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um... And Ellen White and Patriarchs and Prophets, I mean, this just cannot be said better. This is so perfectly said, so beautifully said, and uh, I'm just so committed to it. So she's describing here Genesis 1 and 2, and she says, Eve was taken, was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam, signifying that she was not to control him as the head, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal. This is pre-Genesis 3. In my mind, this is an unambiguous affirmation by Ellen White of the non-hierarchical nature of the relationship between Adam and Eve before sin. I, uh, this, is, this is unambiguous. This is clear. To be loved and protected by Him. Now, there is a difference of role, and we'll talk about this afternoon in, in our presentation on Happily Ever After, a very brief presentation, but in terms of ontological and hierarchical equality, they are the same. Um, I'm going to skip over that. It's a great quotation, but you just, you didn't, you didn't pay enough for that one. Um, another one quickly here from Richard Davis and Flame of Yahweh. I'm just trying to move along here so that I don't bore you to death because I could talk about this for a long time. Davidson again says, Adam and Eve are not slaves to do the menial work of the gods as in, ancient, in the ancient Near Eastern uh, stories, but co-regents. I've already made this point. The king and the queen of their earthly dominion. Finally, the Sabbath. This is really beautiful. In uh, Genesis 2, 1 to 3, given by God at the climax of the creation week. Look at this. Reveals a palace in time. Ooh, I love it in which the human family may join together in spiritual fellowship and in communion with their maker. Ah, just absolutely beautiful. So Edenic and beautiful and wonderful. Now, just the briefest of, of observations about Ephesians chapter 5. I mentioned earlier that that's that section that I always preach on when I'm asked to do a wedding. Invariably, I go to Ephesians 5, where among other things, God or Paul speaking, God speaking through Paul says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That phrase, gave himself, is a very important phrase in Paul's understanding of the atonement and of the gospel. In fact, some of the best known verses, in fact, many of you could probably finish this verse if I began quoting it. It goes like this, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me. Can anybody finish this? and gave himself for me. So notice what Paul does here. He uses love and gave himself as grammatical equivalents. For Paul, there is no differentiation between to love and to give yourself. Listen again now to Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church. And what am I going to say? Gave himself for her. Okay, the giving of oneself is synonymous with love. Thomas Aquinas, the medieval theologian who had a lot of things wrong, but he had this right. He said to love is to will the good of another. 
So love is not passive, and love is certainly not only sensual or erotic. Love is, is active. Is, there's, a, there's a willfulness in love. To love is to will the good of another, to bring about the best good of another. And so I just wanted to highlight that the, the biblical version of marriage and the godly version of marriage is first about giving and only second about getting. We give primarily, we don't get. And when you go into a marital union, and frankly, when you go into a sexual union, if the goal is primarily to get, there is a, there is a fundamental unsatisfactory outcome. But if you go to give, both maritally and socially and sexually, then everybody benefits. If everybody's looking out for everybody else, this is true socially, it's true maritally, it's true sexually, then that's the best of all possible situations. So there's a biblical portrait of marriage, and now I just want to spend a little bit of time, especially for those that are unmarried here, and for those that have young children, to talk about how we find the right partner. How do we find our Adam? How do we find our Eve? And this will be very practical, and if you're young, I'd invite you to pay close attention. So there are a number of what are sometimes referred to as predictors of marital success, and you have probably all heard the somewhat misleading statistic that 50% of marriages end in divorce. This is a highly misleading statistic because when they say that 50% of marriages in, end in divorce, this includes all marriages. So that includes second, third, fourth marriages, right? So let's say that I'm on my first marriage and I have a friend who has had three marriages. So between us, there are four marriages. Well, that's an average of two marriages per person. That's a 50% divorce rate. Okay, first-time marriages actually have a very high success, much higher than 50%, somewhere between, depending on the situation, 60 and 65% chance of success. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a much better statistic, right? If you tell somebody, and there's a lot of, there's a tremendous amount of motivation and agenda in the world today to diminish and to speak derogatively about marriage, Right? Marriage is passe, marriage is old-fashioned, marriage is patriarchal. But I remind you that right at the outset, Timothy Keller said, we don't know of any culture or of any century where marriage was not central to that culture. Okay, so the idea that marriage is passe and marriage is, you know, patriarchal or marriage is inherently oppressive, that's the world that we're living in today. And one of the most important things you can do as parents and grandparents is to regularly positively and enthusiastically communicate to your children, both by example and by your words, that marriage is awesome. We've been talking to our sons about how awesome marriage is uh, since they were very young. And now, happily for us, both of our boys are very much looking forward to being married and having children of their own. Because the the prevailing culture, society is tell them, telling them marriage is ridiculous, marriage doesn't work, you know, infidelity is in your genes, it's not even possible to be faithful, you know, and all of this balderdash and poppycock that's got people's minds confused, and again, is leading them away from the mooring that we have in Scripture. Okay, so first-time marriages actually have a very high chance, not very high, but, but relatively high, it's much better than 50%, somewhere between 60 and 65% chance. Now, the number one predictor, well, let me ask you this question. What's the number one predictor of an athletic injury? Well, you'd probably know that. What's the number one predictor? I'm putting you right on the spot here, Josh. So, so I've injured my knee. What's the number one predictor of the fact that I've injured my knee? I've injured it before, right? So the, the number one predictor of injury is previous injury. Does that make sense? So the number one predictor of divorce is previous divorce. So if you're on your second or third marriage, the chances of you getting divorced are higher than if you're on your first marriage. Now, I have friends that are on their second or even my mom is on her third marriage, and she finally found a great man, a man that she's been married to now for more than 40 years, and praise the Lord, second marriages can be wildly successful. So can even third marriages, but your best shot at a happy marriage is your first marriage because the number one predictor of divorce is previous divorce. The number two predictor of divorce is parental divorce. Okay, so if, if, you're, if, if you are marrying someone whose parents are still together and your parents are still together, this adds several percentage points to that 60 to 65 percent. I want to go through several predictors of marital success. So the first one there is having an annual household income of uh, $60,000 pre-tax income. Okay, because financial strain, as everybody in this room knows, financial strain actually increases other kinds of strain. 
And so one of the most basic things that you can do in your marriage in order to insulate you from possible divorce is to have a reasonable household income. Okay, this is not a guarantee. None of these are guarantees of marital success. And also, even if you check every one of the 10 predictors of marital success that I'm going to give you, it doesn't mean that you will have a successful marriage. But I'll tell you this. If you check all the boxes, you can get your statistical likelihood of marital success something like 80% or more, which is a far better and far more um, encouraging prospect than just saying to kids dismissively, well, more than 50% of marriages end in divorce anyway. It's a lie. It's not true. Okay? So number one, a household income of over $60,000. Um, number two, that your parents did not divorce, right? Now again, in my marriage, my wife's family is still, still together. I sometimes remark that her family is really weird because she comes from a family of five siblings. I come from a family of five siblings. And this is, I know you're going to find this hard to believe, but it's totally true. All of my wife's brothers and sisters come from the same parents. All of them. They look the same. It's incredible. You can actually detect that they are all biologically related. In my family, we have as many dads as there are children, and we have one less mom than there are children, okay? And my family feels totally normal to me, right? And it's a very modern family. We got pulled a little bit here and drag him in and put him in, okay, and here we go. We put it all together. We call it the Asherick family. This does not bode statistically well for my future marriages, but my wife's family is still together. My wife's parents are still together. And so we, that's a bit of a push, what we would say a push, right? She gets the plus and I get the minus. Again, even if my family is divorced, it doesn't mean that I will necessarily get divorced, but we take on board some of the cultural and, and social aspects of the legitimacy of divorce when we come from a home that is divorced. My mom was divorced twice. Now she's very happily married. Okay, so that's number one, number, number, or number two. Number three, one of the predictors of marital success is religious people tend to be married longer. They marry more quickly and they stay married longer, people that are devoutly religious. And uh, also regular religious attendance, church attendance is a predictor of marital success. Um, we're living in a time right now where, where procreation rates are actually below uh, replacement rate. You might have known that. Um, people are not having children anymore. And in a lot of countries, this is becoming so problematic that they're actually, it's going to be an economic disaster for a lot of countries, especially Northern European countries. When we lived in Australia, if you had a child, the Australian government gave you almost 10,000 bucks just to have a child. And then they give you an astonishing amount of money just to keep that child, right? They are incentivizing having children because a lot of secular governments realize, whoa, 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 wait a minute. There was all this big push, oh, the earth is overpopulated, oh, you know, climate and all that. And then now a lot of nations are saying, um, wait a minute, we are not going to be able to sustain our aging population at something like 1.2, 1.4, 1 1.6 rate of procreation. You need about 2.2 to be just at replacement rate. And right now in the United States of America, for the first time in a long time, in the last five to ten years, we've slid below replacement rate. But remarkably, the people that are still having children are all religious. Conservative Catholics are having children. Conservative uh, Protestants are having children. Muslims are having children. Jews are having children. So if time should last long enough, I've got good news for you. The future is religious. Because secular people and irreligious people are not having children at anywhere near the rates as religious people. So my strong encouragement to you is to be fruitful and multiply. Have lots of kids. Lots and lots. We only had two, and I'm regretting it every day. I wish we had four. I wish we had more than that. So, regular church attendance, number four, a college-level education, not a surefire indication of marital success, but, and I'm a little reluctant to, to, go, to wade too deep into these waters, but I'm only going to say, the thing that a college education provides can also be provided by an apprenticeship or a vocational uh, opportunity, because really what you're getting is less the education and more the discipline in that transitional period between about 17 and 22. That's, that's, I believe, what college is offering, right? A lot of the degrees today that are being offered by colleges are not skill-based degrees, and you come out of that college and you have an astonishing amount of debt and you don't have a skill. Now, I've told my sons, look, if you go to college, I'm happy to support that, but make sure you come out with some degree that's a skill-based degree. You're going to be a physical therapist, you're going to be an engineer, you're going to be a nurse, you're going to be a doctor. Something that's a skill-based degree 
because you are actually taking a significant risk to just go to college and get a more general degree, have forty dollars to $100,000 in debt, and you might not be any more employable than somebody else. So the point about college is not that college somehow gets you a little pass into marital bliss or success. It's that it gives you that sort of period between 17 and 21, 22 to learn discipline, to learn that what gets measured gets done, to, to become a man, frankly, or a woman. Um, number five, the length of dating before a marriage. There's actually a very interesting sort of bell curve here. Couples that date very, very short uh, be- prior to getting married actually uh, get divorced at high rates, as you might expect. They're like marrying a stranger. But strangely, couples that date for a very long time, more than two years, actually also have higher divorce rates than those that date for between one and two. So the idea here is that, and I tell people this all the time, when you, if you are of age, say you're 21, 22, 24, 25, 30 years old, and you've been dating somebody for a year, you know what's in the store. You've walked around the store enough times, you know what's there. You're not going to discover any new information in the next year. And so inside of a year, and usually in a lot less time than that, but inside of a year, you should know whether or not to go forward or to call it off. But too many young people, and I, I really want the teenagers listening here, too many young people fall victim to what's called the sunk cost fallacy. And the sunk cost fallacy is like, well, I've already put so much in, so I probably should put more in. No, 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 no. If it's a bad situation after three months, don't see how it is in six months, because now you have more emotional ties, more history, more shared experiences, and it's harder to break off at six months than it is at three. Right? The sunk cost fallacy says, well, let's give it one, six more months. Now, you, before you know it, you're in it for a year. I've met people who've been dating for five years. They're not sure if they're ready for a commitment yet. And my wife and I, we, have, we joke about this all the time. We, you know, I will say to her, sweetheart, I, th- I think I'm ready to marry you. I, th- I think I'm ready for a commitment. Right? Because we've literally evangelistically gone into the homes of people who have a home together, who have a family together, who have shared finances together, and are unmarried. And when you inquire about their unmarried status, we've literally heard people say to us, well, you know, we're afraid of commitment. So... The sweet spot for dating and marriage is somewhere between about eight months and two years, okay, depending on age. It's age dependent. Okay, quickly. Um, The age that you are married is also a predictor of marital success. The sweet spot for marriage is somewhere between the ages of about 21, 22, and 26. Now, again, it doesn't mean that if you're married before that, that you can't have a wonderful, happy, successful marriage, and it doesn't mean that if you're married after that. But what ends up happening is, as we age, neurologically, we, in, we become increasingly settled in who we are. This is like a, we become concretized in who we are. And so if you are looking for someone to fit what you already are as a 30-year-old, as a 35-year-old, you might find that person. It does happen. I, I know situations where, where people meet just the right person, you know, in their late 20s or early 30s or even late 30s. It can happen. But now you're looking for a very specific kind of person because you are very settled in who and what you are. At the age of 21, 22, 23, you're still becoming what it is that you're going to be. And so if you hitch your wagon to somebody else who's, who's somewhat mature and developed but not fully mature and developed and not completely immature, now what will happen is you will grow together. And that pliability and that malleability is actually a predictor of marital success. I was 26 when Violetta and I were married, and Violetta was 23. And uh, we didn't do the whole, you know, you know, one to two years of dating, that's for sure. Um, just because, you know, she was single, she was godly, she came from a great family. I mean, I waited as long as I could. Um, And to everyone's astonishment, she said yes. Okay, Um, another predictor of marital success is not having children inside of the first year. It's a very good idea. The Bible actually says that you were to take a year off from war and to spend time together. I know that nowadays it's, you know, we take a week or two of a honeymoon. But, you know, take some time off. Grow into your love with one another and uh, wait at least a little while to have um, children. Uh, number nine, realistic expectation. Uh, waiting to uh, number eight, excuse me, waiting to have sex until marriage is a tremendous predictor of marital success, and uh, we'll talk more about this, I think, this afternoon. But but premarital sex is a departure, is a deviation from God's sexual design uh, and His sexual ideal described in Genesis one and two, and it's a recipe for unhappiness and heartbreak, as well as a recipe for a lot of other things like unwanted pregnancies and sexually transmitted diseases, and it's a long list. Okay, so this is a predictor of marital success. Number nine, realistic expectation of marriage. And number ten, strangely perhaps, um, the size of the wedding. 
Marriages that have wedding parties of greater than 100 have a higher rate of success than those that have a marital, marital party of less than 100. Now, why might that be? What does, what, what are, what's being communicated when you have a wedding that has 200 or 300 attendees? You have families, you have community, you have people that are invested in your... A shotgun wedding where there's five people standing at the altar, it might work out fine, but when you go to a large wedding and whole communities, whole families are being joined together, then it shows you that you're very likely going to have a support structure in order to succeed. Okay, I could say a lot more about that, just a few quick things, and then we'll close it up. Again, from Timothy Keller, both men and women today see marriage not as a way of creating character and community, but as a way to reach personal life goals. And this is what... Keller calls a me marriage. I'm looking for someone to help me develop my potential so that I can succeed. He goes on to say they are looking for a marriage partner who will fulfill their, fulfill their emotional, sexual, and spiritual desires, and that creates an extreme idealism that in turn leads to a deep pessimism that you will ever find the right person to marry. This is the reason that so many put off marriage and look right past great prospective spouses that are simply not good enough. And I think Keller is exactly correct here. To conduct a me marriage requires a completely well-adjusted, happy two, excuse me, well-adjusted, completely well-adjusted, happy individuals with very little in the way of emotional neediness of their own or character flaws that need a lot of work. The problem is, is that there is almost no one like that out there to marry. You might have noticed. I've been encouraging my son since they were very young, look, you know, you want to be drafting in the first round, if possible. Um... <laughs> You can, there are some great spouses to be found in the second, third, and fourth round of the draft, but, but you'll be better off drafting in that first round, and uh, they know exactly what I'm talking about. Marriage brings you into a more intense proximity to any other human being than any other relationship can, and uh, I think I'll just leave it right there. That's a good place to end it. Hopefully, that was a blessing. We spent time sort of looking at two things. Uh, number one, the biblical portrait of marriage and, of course, is the outgrowth of marriage, of human sexuality. And then I wanted to spend a little time talking about predictors of marital success because we're living in a culture and in a context right now where there is so much dismissiveness about marriage. And I want to appeal, and we'll talk about this. It'll be really fun, I think, this afternoon. One of the things I want to talk a little bit about is how to have a happy marriage. I'm actually in the midst of writing a book right now with my good friend, Dr. Jennifer Jill Schwerzer, titled Try This at Home. And it's going to be a series of books. We're going to write books on marriage. We're going to write a book on dating. We're going to write a book on um, parenting and court, uh, dating and courting and parenting. And uh, so I'm really excited about it. So it's a, a subject I'm deeply passionate about. I've been happily married for 20 plus years. And I know that not everybody has that experience. The good news is, is that just as God is in the business of healing broken people and saving broken people, God can heal and save broken marriages. And God can put very difficult situations back together and bring happy uh, beautiful circumstances and situations out of it. Um, there are people that get involved in marriages that are deeply unhealthy, that are unfaithful and abusive, and uh, those are not marriages that you should be sticking around in. And you should separate yourself from those situations. If you find yourself, and I've had too many women in my office, and even the occasional man, but too many women in my office over the years who say that everything that was promised the day after the wedding or you know the day after the honeymoon, everything suddenly changed. In fact, I recently married a, a couple that uh, uh, was divorced in a matter of months. And uh, knowing what I knew about the situation, uh, it was really tragic. The truth is, is that all of the yellow flags were there. And what I tell young couples that are preparing for marriage, here's the thing. You can tolerate a yellow flag, maybe even two yellow flags, but three yellow flags makes a red flag, and a red flag means it's a no-go. Okay? So very often, people who find themselves in bad marriages, unfaithful marriages, unfortunate marriages, can look back with retrospection and say, you know what, the warning signs were there. I should have seen, I should have known. And this is why it's essential, in my opinion, that you bring in godly counselors, hopefully godly parents and others, to evaluate and to see if, in fact, this is a good marriage or a good potential marriage. I know that it's not the way that we live, and it certainly is ancient and old-fashioned, but actually, statistics show that arranged marriages have a higher percentage of success in many of the countries that practice arranged marriages than the way that we do dating now in the United States of America. The way that we do dating now is an absolute uh, apocalyptic landscape. And if you're over the age of about 30, you can just thank God 
that you don't have to go and try and find a spouse in this wasteland because it is so upside down, so backward to God's intent that um, we'll talk about that, I think, a little bit this afternoon. So hopefully that was enjoyable to you. Um, we'll close with prayer, and we have a closing song probably. Oh, yeah, he touched me. <laughs> or was it nothing between? Or was it softly and tenderly? <laughs> Father in heaven, this has been a great session. I hope it's been enjoyable for everybody and educational. And Father, especially for those young people, the as yet unmarried, Father, I pray that this has cast a vision for them for how awesome and wonderful marriage can be. And that they will be, even now, even if they're very young, 14, 15, 16, they'll be at least thinking about the kind of person that they would like to unite their life with. And Father, for those that are older in their late teens or early to mid-20s or 30s, if they're unmarried, Father, give them a sense, a strong sense that you can still work in them and through them, that they are not in any way um, uh, not a bearer of your image if they are unmarried. Father, you call some people to celibacy. You call some people to singleness. And so, Father, I just pray for every marriage that's in here. I pray that those marriages would be strengthened, that the volume on the romance and the happiness and the joy and the connection, all those volume knobs would be turned all the way up. And, Father, if there are struggling marriages here today, I just pray that they would learn forgiveness, humility, um, that they would, if, if is needed, find help outside of their marriage, and that they would, they would be able to put things back together by your grace. Um, Father, we love you, we thank you, and we do pray that, that our godly marriages would be an example in a world that is becoming increasingly unmoored from reality with regards to human relationships and sexuality. Uh, we love you and thank you in the powerful saving name of Jesus. Amen.